Hello everybody and welcome to Lockdown Literature, courtesy of the Studio Online and the National Lottery Community Fund. You are about to listen to an audio story from a series of writing gathered during the COVID-19 lockdown from both the adults and children's write-on sessions. So relax, settle back and enjoy a selection of writing from some of the finest creative minds at the studio. Unrequited by Yvette Kiaski, read by Louise Nolte. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. Every couple has that sweet story of how they met. Stephen and I are no different. My mind wanders to the day we fell in love at first sight, as the train I am currently on lazily shudders and lilts as it leaves the station on this wet and bleak Tuesday afternoon. It had been magical. He had come into the florist where I worked at the time to buy flowers, lilies. He said they were for his girlfriend, but I knew there and then that there was something between us, and as his fingertips grazed the soft skin on the palm of my hand as he paid, I think we both knew then that this was the start of something special. My whole body shudders as I remember that touch. I called him that night. I said nothing. We didn't need words. I called him every night for weeks, never saying anything. I just listened to the way his breathing quickened the more I called, the merest hint of fear betraying the angry pretense he tried to maintain. I know he knew it was me, that he was waiting for my next call. That's why he never let her answer the phone. I'd sent flowers to the house, no card. I always made sure they were Lily so he knew they were from me. But it was when I started to watch him that it became real. Just him going about his day as normal while I looked on. It was all so romantic. He'd leave the house at the same time each morning to head to the train station nearby. She wouldn't even go to the front door to wave him off. I would call in sick just to follow him to work. Oh, now I've lost my job at the florist. I can devote all of my time to my relationship with Stephen. He lets me know he is thinking of me from time to time by wearing the same tie he wore that day we met. This morning, before he went to work, I even went to the house. I put a note through the door that just said, Soon we can be together with a single lily. The rocking of the carriage draws my attention back to the present as the train slows down for our station. I watch Stephen stand up four rows ahead and make his way to the doors. He seems perturbed by something, almost like he senses me. A man passes me and I use the opportunity to stand and be shielded by him. The doors whoosh open and Stephen disembarks, striding purposefully along the platform. He walks faster than normal and I can only just see his head above the crowd as he moves along the head of the sea of commuters. As the throng disperses, I notice his fists are clenched and his jaw is tight, a vein throbs in his forehead. As we leave the station, the rain does not deter Stephen and his mission. I struggle to keep up, my breath heavy and laboured. Does he know I'm here? With each corner he turns, my heart lurches. But this is not out of sight, out of mind. He is always on my mind. He is my last thought as I go to sleep and my first thought as I wake. I think about the picture of him on my bedside table. He looks strong but lean, his chiselled face catching the light as he looks deep in thought, a candid photo of him at work. It is my favourite of many, the others adorning the walls of my flat. As we near the house, it becomes clear that he has not lost any of the urgency in his gait. His feet hammer the pavement in great strides, sending puddles of water in all directions. But the weather does not deter him. He takes the small steps outside his front door two at a time. He unlocks the door and enters in one swift movement, slamming it behind him. 
there and then I decide that this is the moment. I need to be with him to help him through whatever is troubling him. I walk towards the side of the house and let myself in through the wrought iron gate. Every nerve in my body pulses. I've never been to the back of the house before. As I near the window, I hear something. Stephen's voice is raised. As I glance in through the kitchen window, it's what I expected. Classic, elegant, clearly Stephen's input rather than hers. I can see my future here when he finally admits his love for me. Maybe that's what's happening now. The rain continues to pour and the droplets run down the window, mirroring the tears running down her face. He yells at her that he wants answers. But answers to what? She cowers and cries that she doesn't know what's happening. She has no idea who sent the flowers and made the phone calls. He screams at her again. He calls her Lily. Then it hits me. He thinks the flowers I sent to him were for her. All those calls, he thought it was somebody ringing for her. How could he forget what we had? He continues to interrogate her loudly. How long has this been going on, Lily? He demands. I don't know what you're talking about, Stephen. There isn't anything going on. Tell me the truth, you cheating bitch. Lily knelt on the floor, begging him. Please, Stephen, you must listen to me. I don't know anything about who sent them. Liar! Stephen turns and picks something up from the kitchen counter. Through the rain-soaked window, I struggle to see what it is. Lily is standing now, and as he turns back to face her, she grabs at his lapels, trying to get him to listen to her. Stephen's arm jerks forward forcefully. Suddenly, a grip on him loosens. She slowly stares into his eyes like a deer caught in the headlights, and she slumps down his body and onto the floor. Then I see it. The blade catches the light. And the deep viscous liquid drips slowly onto the polished tiled floor. Stephen stands back, looking down at Lily's lifeless body. The ultimate portrayal of power. He is almost admiring in his gaze. A wry smile slowly spreads across his face. He enjoyed it. His pleasure is evident. As I stand watching him, as I have done a thousand times before, my mind cannot comprehend what I have just witnessed. My breath sticks in my lungs. My brain begins to feel foggy and I become lightheaded. I force the air into my lungs in short, sharp inhalation. He looks at me. He looks at me for the first time since I fell in love with him. The smile has faded from his lips. We both stand rooted to the spot like hundred-year-old oak trees. He seems puzzled to see me there. We stay this way for what seems like an age. As he lunges for the door, it takes me a second to realise what is happening. I'm next. I turn and make my way back down the path towards the front of the house. My wet clothes feel like they're weighing me down, preventing me from making any progress. As I reach the wrought iron gate, I fondle the catch, but I can't open it. I hear heavy footsteps behind me splashing through the rain. I try the gate again. It opens. I make my way onto the street, desperately searching for another human being to help me. The irony is not lost on me as I think of all those times I waited here, trying not to be noticed. There is not a soul around. The dark night and rain have evidently driven people to seek shelter. I make the snap decision to turn right, head back towards the station. The footsteps behind me continue and with every turn I make it feel like he's gaining on me. My mind snakes with a million thoughts all clamouring to be heard. In my confusion I take a wrong turn, suddenly I'm in the park, careering past swings and seesaws. I think about all the families that have such a nice time here on hot summer days, their laughter floating through the air as they play and eat ice cream. It's a world away from that now, I recognise. As my legs begin to ache and my muscles scream for me to stop. Footsteps, footsteps, footsteps. I run into the trees thinking the darkness will allow me some disguise. When I am deep enough, I hide behind one of them. The footsteps stop as the wet leaves mute all sound. My breathing is heavy. My heart beats loudly in my ears. I hold my breath, conscious of any noise. 
Eventually I pluck up the courage to peer to my right, around the thick trunk. There's nobody there. I exhale. I decide to stay for a moment to check all is clear. I rest the back of my head against the tree to try and stop the world from spinning. My chest moves heavily up and down as I desperately try to get more oxygen, ready to run to safety. I turn my head back to the left. A face greets mine. We're so close our noses are almost touching. I spin again and start to run, but Stephen is too quick for me. He trips me and I just have time to put my hands out in front of me as I fall to the ground. He is quickly behind me and flips me over. He straddles me at the waist, pinning me to the mulch of wet leaves and bark. There is nothing left in my lungs to cry for help. There is madness and confusion in his eyes. Do I know you? He snarls in my face. Death cannot come soon enough now. He loves me. He loves me not. <laughs>